<laughs> if you want to use the Bibles there in the pews, uh, you can find it on page 740, 740, Matthew chapter 26. We're actually going to be in Matthew 26 and Matthew 27 this morning. I uh, love to hear those pages turning. That's great. Um, if you're new here today, I want to tell you your friend's been praying for you. We, uh, I've asked you to commit to two things, or the members of this church to commit to two things. One is be, be, uh, in, be here every Sunday for this message series, that you would commit to doing that, that uh, because during this time, man, we are learning about the greatest thing, the greatest event in history, and that's Jesus' death on the cross. Second thing that I asked you to do last week is that you would commit to praying for your friends or family or coworkers or somebody in your life, your sphere of influence, that you'd be praying for them uh, to bring them to church, to invite them to come and hear this message, the saving grace of Jesus Christ and what God has done for us through the cross. So if you're here today, we welcome you. Your, your friend has been praying for you. Your family member has been praying for you. Uh, and for the rest of you, keep praying and keep inviting. Uh, as as uh, we get started here, I want you to think about this question. Have you ever been betrayed by someone you love? Hmm. <laughs> Don't answer out loud. There is a story I read last week uh, about a soldier who, uh, I mean, this is a number of years ago, he received a Dear John letter from his girlfriend back home in the States while he was overseas. And um, to add insult to injury, his girlfriend had written in this letter, will you please return my favorite photo of myself? I need it for my engagement picture in the newspaper. Of course, the soldier, you can imagine, is, is really devastated by this letter and all his soldier buddies came to his rescue though so that what they did is they went throughout the whole camp and every soldier donated a picture of his girlfriend so they had filled this entire shoe box of pictures of all the guy's girlfriends in this guy's camp right he sends the shoe box to his girlfriend in the states or his ex-girlfriend now in the states who's getting married and it had a note inside and in the note he wrote this Please find your picture and return the rest. For the life of me, I can't remember which one you were. <laughs> oh, man, you talk about uh, retaliation, right? Isn't that great? If, if only we could get back to, uh, at those who have done us wrong. Betrayal. We could make a list of many people throughout history who have betrayed uh, different people, different even countries. You know, in the American Revolution, it was, remember who it was? Benedict Arnold, right? Um, you know, we had uh, 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 Caesar, had Brutus. Of course, Jesus, as we're going to talk about this morning, had Judas. But what we're going to learn is that it, it was more than just Judas that deserted Jesus. It, there was this entire mass exodus, exodus of Jesus' loyal followers when it came down to Jesus' arrest. Many, many, many people left him behind. In fact, everybody left him behind. Uh, and it seems, seems like it goes against all the odds if you really think about it. Here were a group of people that Jesus had called. I mean, he singled them out, right? Follow me. And these guys willingly gave up everything they had to follow Jesus. They left their jobs, they left their homes, they left family members to follow Jesus and become uh, his students. And they followed him around for three years. And these guys, man, they were there with him through everything. They watched the miracles. They heard his teachings. And yet, when it came down to it in Jesus' most dire hour, they couldn't stick around. Why? Why is that? That's what we're going to talk about this morning. Why did Jesus' friends desert him? We're going to look at three different stories and how they apply to us maybe even today uh, and why they left. And so we're going to start. I hope you'll take notes this morning there in the bulletins on the back as a place to fill in some blanks. And I hope you'll do that as we go along this morning. Why did Jesus' friends desert him? And let's start with this first story of the disciples. The disciples' story themselves is, is unreal. On the night that Jesus was arrested... He leads his disciples, of course, to the Mount of Olives, right? Um, what's interesting is he tells them exactly what's coming. He tells them straight up, here's what's going to happen. You guys are all going to fall away. And, you know, he just tells them straight up. And Peter's like, oh, no, I'll never let that happen to you. I, you know, I'm going to be with you, and, and I'll even fight for you, Jesus. And uh, so they can't believe that they're going to leave Jesus all deserted and alone. And that's when, of course, Jesus tells Peter, well, hey, Peter, you know what? Here's the deal. On this very night, you're going to deny that you even know me three times. And Peter's like, oh, that'll never happen. Well, from there, after this conversation, they go into the Garden of Gethsemane, 
And this is like a very uh, private, intimate spot for Jesus and his disciples. And he kind of leaves some of them behind. He takes Peter, uh, James, and John with him. And he says, okay, wait here. You watch and pray while I go over here. And Jesus does his own praying, right? He wants this cup to pass. Yet not my will, but yours be done, Father. And he's praying this prayer. And Jesus, like, he's, like I say, he tells his three uh, closest associates, pray, keep watch and pray. And Jesus comes back and checks on them. And what are, they do- what are they doing? They're sleeping. They can't stay awake, right? Jesus does this three times. He goes away. He says, okay, you guys got to stay awake. Pray. Keep watch. You know? And he goes back and he does his own prayer. He comes back. They're sleeping again. Man, can't you guys keep watch for just one hour? Just, just stay awake and pray for I really need you. He goes away and he comes back. He's sleep- they're sleeping again. He does this three times. And on the last time, that's when, that's when everything breaks loose. Judas shows up with his, uh, with his detachment of, of soldiers, with religious leaders, and um, he shows up ready to betray his best friend. And he kisses Jesus on the cheek, and a skirmish breaks out, and, and Peter cuts off an ear, and Jesus heals, and it's just, it gets wild really fast. And then Jesus speaks to the angry mob. And this is where we're going to pick it up in verse 55 of, of Matthew chapter 26. Jesus speaks to these guys. It says, at that time, Jesus said to the crowd, am I leading a rebellion that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I sat in the temple courts teaching and you didn't arrest me. In other words, you had your chance, right? But he says, this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. So it had to happen this way. Then what happens? All the disciples did what? They deserted him and they fled. They got out of there. They couldn't hang around to see what was going to happen next. The phrase I want you to write down and think about as you think about the disciple story is this. It's, it's a story of fatigue and fear. They were tired and they were also afraid. When Jesus requested their prayers, they wanted to comply. They had a desire to fulfill what Jesus had asked them to do but they were just too tired. You know, think about it. They had eaten this big supper, the Passover meal, really filling, you know. What do you want to do after you eat a, a big meal? Thanksgiving Day, right? We're all on the couch. You know, this is the disciples, man. I'm ready to sleep. They want to do what Jesus asked them to do, but they just can't. And so Jesus tells them, you know what? The spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Have you ever been so tired that, that you had a hard time staying awake? You know, think about those moments in your life. Oh, man, I've been there, you know, maybe during a movie. Dawn, how many times have I fallen asleep in the movie theater? It happens, you know, you're sitting there, and the next thing you know, you're out, and, like, you miss half the, the movie. Uh, maybe at the office and you're at your desk. Uh, maybe during a workshop or a seminar, guilty, you know, I'm sitting in a, in, a, in a comfortable chair. Next thing I know, I'm out trying to listen to the speaker, right? Uh, maybe right now, got any sleepers out there today? <laughs> uh, the Spirit is willing. Man, I want to be in this moment. I want to hear what Jesus has to say to me, and I want to pray, and I want to do what God wants me to do. But man, my, my body is weak. I am just so tired. I need rest. What a great description. The Spirit is willing, but the body is weak. We have good intentions, don't we, sometimes? We have good intentions to pray. And that's what Jesus asked his disciples to do. Right? We have good intentions to pray, but man, it's a lot easier to invest 20 minutes filling out the NCAA brackets. How many of you got those done this week? Oh, come on. You don't even want to raise your hands. Guilty, right? It's easier to spend 20 minutes filling out you know, your brackets for the, for the uh, you know, March Madness and all that than it is to set aside 20 minutes to pray. Spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Man, I want to do this. Or, or maybe, maybe you, you know, you know, you, sh- you sh- should spend more time with the kids and and with your spouse in prayer, and praying with them. And so, you know, you, you almost at night you can't wait to get them to bed, so that you can get back to the couch, so you can sleep yourself. You know, you know, you should pray. The spirit is willing. I know I should pray with them, but man, I don't know. I'm so tired. The body is weak. The disciples were tired. They were worn out. They were fatigued. And they fell asleep. Only to be awakened, now think about this, by a crowd of people who came to arrest Jesus. Can you imagine waking up 
from this slumber, this deep sleep, and all of a sudden you got 600 people around you with torches and swords and weapons and clubs, and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? As soon as they had the opportunity, they get out of there. They run for their lives because they're afraid what's going to happen. Ross Broadfear wrote this. He said, each of these men had a not-so-secret desire for power. They associated with Jesus in part so they could run with him or rule with him in the end. When it looked more like the option was to bleed beside Jesus rather than reign beside Jesus, their conviction faltered. Isn't that true? And maybe for you, it's not so much fatigue or you're tired, but maybe it is fear. Maybe you are afraid of what's going to happen. You fear maybe in your life that ridicule will come because you, st- you take a stand for Jesus. Or maybe you want to read your Bible at the office or in your workplace during your lunch hour, and you want to get that out, but man, you're just afraid what people are going to say. Or you want to ask that neighbor to come to church, but you're not sure if you can stay on good terms after that, right? You're afraid of what's going to happen in the relationship. You don't want it to sever because of Jesus So you're very selective with whom you share your commitment in Jesus Christ. You're in the Lord's army, but maybe you're more in the secret service. (laughs) You're undercover, right? The disciples' story is one of fatigue. They're tired. They're worn out. But it's also one of fear. They're afraid what's going to happen. If they stick with Jesus, are they going to die? Are they going to be turned in? Are they going to have to go to jail? What's the deal? So my question to you this morning is, is yours that story? I pray not. But maybe you are tired or maybe you are afraid of what's going to happen. Here's the second story I want us to look at, and that is Simon Peter's story. Simon Peter's uh, story is this, and Peter tells Jesus, remember, even if I have to die with you, I, I will never desert you. He uses this phrase, I, a lot. He says, even if those other guys, even if these other guys stand around us right now, even if they leave you, Lord, I never will. You can hear the number of times I is used in this, in this uh, dialogue between Peter and Jesus, and, 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 and this is serious business. There's an old story uh, about old farmer Brown, whose pond had nearly dried up from the, the long summer drought, and so uh, that posed no problem, of course, for the ducks. The ducks could fly off to another pond, but it posed a huge problem for the frogs because they couldn't go to another pond, uh, so eventually it would lead to their death. So one of the frogs got a brilliant idea. He, he told the ducks, here's what we're going to do. Two of you will hold a twig in your beaks or in your bills, and I'll jump up and grab onto the stick with my mouth, and you guys can take off flying to another pond, and we'll keep flying until we find another place where we can survive. They thought it was a great idea, so they got the twig. The two ducks got the twig in their, in their bills, and the frog jumped up and grabbed the, uh, the twig with his mouth, and he was hanging on. They, got, they took to flying off. Old Farmer Brown, seeing the whole thing happen in that moment, uh, he's like, wow, this is, this is unbelievable. This is ingenious. Who ever thought of such a brilliant idea? The frog opened his mouth and said, I did! <laughs> the frog opened his mouth. We get into trouble We get into trouble when we have eye trouble, don't we? In that moment, you think about this. Here's Peter. I'll never die. I'll I'll never desert you. I'll I'll even die with you. Here in in that moment, think about this. In that moment, there are no soldiers. There are no weapons. There are no torches. There are no clubs. There are no non-believers gathered in that moment when Peter's talking about this, right? It's easy for us when we're in the moment. We come to church, and man, we can live it up. Man, I am righteous, I'm good, I'm great today, because I'm with my fellow believers. But what happens when we get out there, when the fire, when the heat turns up? It's a whole different story, isn't it? When the heat turned up for Peter, that's when he began to cower. Part of Peter's story is one of, uh, of arrogance, and in his arrogance, he says, I'll never desert you, Jesus. I'll, I will never desert you. He even sticks up for Jesus in the garden. We're thinking, yeah, go Peter. You know, he cuts off the high, high priest servant's ear. Yet he runs off with the others. He leaves Jesus deserted there in that moment. He leaves Jesus all alone. What I find interesting is that he doesn't go too far, though, right? He kind of follows 
the, these people, as they lead Jesus into the, the courtyard of the high priest, he's with John. John gets him into this courtyard, and Peter's kind of sticking close, and we're thinking, man, maybe, maybe he's going to actually stick it out. He's going to do what he said and stick it out with Jesus. And so, total desertion hasn't taken place yet, but let's pick it up in verse 69 of Matthew 26. In verse 69, it says, Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him. You were also with Jesus of Galilee, and she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another girl saw him and said to the people there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath. I swear, I don't know the man. After a little while... Those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. And he began to call down curses on himself, and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Uh, in Luke's account, uh, when Jesus or when Peter denies knowing Jesus this third time, P, uh, Luke gives this chilling moment, and he says, "The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter." And it wasn't one of those like haughty looks, like I told you so. I, I told you you were going to do this. No, it was. I think it was more like disappointment. You know, his friend had let him down. What a chilling moment. So here's Peter's story. We talked about the arrogance side. So write down arrogance and also one of intimidation. That's why he deserted Jesus. His arrogance kind of led to his downfall and his, the intimidation of others around him. He, he just kind of caved to that. Is your spiritual life kind of like that of Peter's maybe? Maybe it's not all the disciples put together. Maybe it's Peter's. Maybe, maybe your spiritual life is up and down. It's a little inconsistent, and you know it just depends on what's going on. Maybe you struggle with this pride. Oh, that'll never happen to me, or I'll never do that. Or maybe you struggle with the intimidation. You know, I want my friends to like me. I want people to like me, so I'm not going to put myself out there as a Christian. And so maybe you're intimidated by the fact that you'll be chided over the fact that you're a Christian. And, 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 and so interesting about Peter's encounter, it seems obvious to the crowd who Peter is, right? You know, they, they've got him nailed down. Definitely after the second time they, they tell him, man, you're definitely with Jesus. The accent had given him away, you know. And Yet when confronted, even at the third time when confronted, Peter, I think he does what a lot of Christians do, and, and, and he puts up a fight rather than admit he's wrong. Like, we've got you. We know who you are. Oh, no, you're wrong. You know? He can't admit he's wrong. And I think about our personal lives, a Christian friend may come to us uh, and be concerned about an area in our lives in which we're kind of faltering and we're like, you know, and they, so they, they get up the nerve, right? They come, out, came, came, they come to us kind of in fear and trembling and they, they want to say, you know, they say, oh man, there's something about you. I, I just want to be careful, but I, I think you need to be aware that what you're doing is wrong. And they lovingly share this concern. And, and what's our response? Oh man, who are you to confront me, Right? Uh, or or let, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Come on, buddy, get your own life right first, right? Or, or uh, you know, judge not lest you be judged. That's our response. When somebody comes to us lovingly and they want to correct something going on in our lives, man, we get defensive like Peter and we totally deny it. We want to put the blame back on them. And, and it's, we can be so arrogant sometimes, I think, that we are above wrongdoing. No way I could do this. Or maybe it is intimidation for you. You know, we can be easily intimidated if we think that, uh, you know, our committed faith will hurt a friendship. You know, we don't want to lose friends over Jesus, right? Or maybe it, it might hurt our career even. Um, I was thinking about, uh, remember the movie, uh, The Passion of the Christ, Mel Gibson's movie years ago, 2004. Um, uh, Mel Gibson told Jim Caviezel, who played Jesus in that movie, man, you might, you might, this might hurt your career because you're playing Jesus. And Jim's, Jim's response was, I don't care. I'm, I, this is the role of a lifetime. Isn't that cool? Would you be willing to go that far for Jesus Christ 
and not be intimidated and say, you know what, it's all about Jesus. I don't care what happens in my career. I don't care, I don't care what happens if I lose friends over this. I know where I'm going at the end of this. Are you there or are you intimidated? How do you handle those intimidating moments in your life? Do you feel like a chameleon sometimes because you have to change your values to match up with what other people expect you to be? Or are you, are you ready to take a stand? Peter deserted Jesus because of arrogance and intimidation. How about you? Let's look at the third story. This last story, of course, is Judas's story. Judas, um, of course, we know what happened with Judas. No way we could do what Judas did, right? That's what we say. I, what's interesting about Judas is it's most likely that Judas was actually one of Jesus' closest friends, closest confidants even. He, Judas kept charge of the money bags. He was very trusted, not just by Jesus, but by the entire group. And, and so uh, when you look at even the Last Supper, uh, at the Last Supper, it's, it's most likely, according to Jewish custom, that Judas actually sat to the left of Jesus. At the, at the table, a place of honor, a place of respect, a place of intimate friendship is where Judas most likely sat. Judas was very close with Jesus. We always picture Judas as this sinister guy, you know, like, what's he up to? Well, I don't trust this guy. But he was really a, a good, decent guy. Um, there's even an Old Testament prophecy in Psalm 41.9. Check this out. It says, even my closest friend whom I trusted, he who I shared my bread has lifted his heel up against me. Isn't that interesting? A prophecy about Judas, my closest friend, the one that dipped his bread in, into the juice with me. He's the one who, who, who deserted me. Now, when you were thinking about na- baby, baby names, maybe names like Peter, James, John, Andrew, you know, those all probably came up, you know. I doubt, I doubt anybody. I was going to look and see if it's in the book of baby names. I don't know if it is or not, but uh, I, I doubt any of you had like Judas in, in your top five. Anybody? <laughs> You know, you don't, you don't name your kid Judas, right? He, he's the guy that betrayed Jesus. Uh, and, and what's interesting is that um, of the 12 apostles, Judas was actually the outsider. The, 11, the other 11 guys, you know, they were from the northern part of Israel in, in Galilee, while Judas was from the southern part of Israel, uh, Judea, and, and so he was the outsider. And Maybe, I don't know if the other guys knew it until after the fact, but Judas, you know, John's gospel tells us that Judas used to help himself from the money bags, the, the corporate money bag, you know, he would help himself to, to the money. And, and, and so Judas had this love for money, and I think his love for money is what superseded his love for Jesus. He was greedy. Now go back in, into Matthew chapter 26, we're going to back up a little bit in verses 14 through 16. We know what happens, Right? Early in the, in the chapter, in, verse, in chapter 26, and verse 14, then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and he asked, what are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. And from then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand Jesus over. Now, Zechariah uh, in the Old Testament was a prophecy in, in chapter 11, verse 12, says the Messiah would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Do you know what that's worth? 30 pieces of silver? You know what that's worth? Get this. It's worth about a house payment. Judas betrays Jesus for a house payment. One month. And I wonder, maybe have we betrayed Jesus for the sake of money? Oh no, I would never do that. Maybe you padded an expense account. Maybe you fudged the numbers on your taxes. Maybe you overcharged a customer. Maybe you made career your God rather than Jesus or God your God. Maybe you've given meagerly to the work of the church. You're holding back on God. I'd never be like Judas. Look what Max Lucado says. He uses his word betray. Max Lucado says betray. The word is an eighth of an inch above betrothed in the dictionary but a world from betrothed in life. It's a weapon found only in the hands of one you love. Your enemy has no such tool, for only a friend can betray. Betrayal is mutiny. It's a violation of trust and inside job. And man, that's exactly what Judas did. He had his money. 
All he had now to do was to complete his transaction by taking the soldiers to where Jesus was that night with 30 pieces of silver and with a kiss, Judas betrays his best friend. How sad. Because of money, because of greed. Go over to Matthew chapter 27. In the first, uh, uh, first few verses here in Matthew chapter 27. After a whole night of trials, back and forth, back and forth, early in the morning, all the chief priests and the elders of the people came to the decision to put Jesus to death. They bound him, they led him away, and handed him over to, be, to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed Jesus, saw that he was condemned, he was seized with remorse, and he returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I betrayed innocent blood. Once that's us, they replied, that's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple, and he left. And then, I want to plead with you. Don't even think about it. Judas commits suicide because... I think he's all out of faith, right? He, out of, <laughs> I mean, think about it, out of selfishness. He, he betrays his best friend. And then out of selfishness, he commits suicide. Don't even toy with this idea, really. It's, it's a, horrend, a horrendous and it's a terrible choice. And suicide is brutal to the friends and the family of those people around him. It's a slap. I think it's a, it's a slap in the face of a God who says, I will work all things to the good of those who love me. Don't even make it an option. Because suicide, I think, it is, is as a result in part, and maybe by a large part, by disillusionment. And you look at Judas's life, he'd become very disillusioned, right? Here's the phrase I want you to write down for Judas, and we'll continue on. But uh, Judas' story is one of greed and one of disillusionment. We say, there's no way I could fall into this trap. I couldn't desert Jesus because of these things. Maybe, maybe really consider this. For Judas, Jesus, he was not the Messiah he was expecting. He was disillusioned. He thought Jesus was going to be this guy who'd come in and, and take over the Roman oppression and, and, and be this political ruler and, and, and just make everything all right. How about you, though? Are you disillusioned with Jesus? You know, maybe you think, isn't God supposed to make us happy all the time? Isn't, isn't God supposed to give us a fairly comfortable lifestyle? Isn't, isn't he supposed to protect us from all the bad stuff that happens in this world? Isn't he supposed to make us successful? Isn't he supposed to like answer my prayer? I've been sick for three weeks now. I can't get rid of this cold. Like, heal me, Lord. <laughs> isn't he supposed to do this? Isn't, isn't this how it's supposed to be? Isn't he supposed to answer every single prayer the way we want? And when we start thinking like this, when we start asking questions like this, we become disillusioned. Jesus tells us, in this world, you will have trouble. It's going to happen. He told us that we're going to be persecuted because we believe in him. In fact, you're going to be so persecuted, some of you are going to have to die for the faith. He never promised us, us, a, he never promised us a comfortable life. Yeah, his burden is light. His yoke is light. But man, we still have to deal with the world, right? Our timing is not always God's timing, but His timing is always right. Amen? Our plans aren't always God's plans. <laughs> I wish they were. But His plans are always right. Amen? It's tough to accept. But when we step out of a disillusioned faith, we can accept it. We can have faith that God's going to get us through. He promised us, us in, um, in Romans 8.28 to make good out of everything that happens to us, to those who love Jesus Christ. And, and what a promise. Good or bad, he'll make something good come out of it. Have you deserted Jesus because of greed or maybe disillusionment? I hope not. Which one are you? The disciples, Simon, Peter, Judas, maybe a combination of all three. My prayer is that we move beyond this and we become better followers of Jesus Christ every single day. And here's the deal, really. We've all deserted Jesus. 
Whether we want to admit it or not, we've all left Jesus hanging out there somewhere. Isaiah 59, chapter, uh, chapter 59, verse 2 says, Your iniquities, your sins, the things you've done wrong have separated you from your God. You've deserted yourself from God because of your wrongdoings. He says your sins have hidden His face from you so that He will not even hear. We're, we've, been, we've deserted Jesus in our sins. The plight of every single human being Every person has ever walked this planet, the plight is that we are separated from God because of our sins. And because of that, we deserve to die. And we deserve to go to hell. But there's an answer. Isaiah 53, 5. Thank God. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced for our sins. He was crushed for our sins, our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon Him and by his wounds, by Jesus' wounds, he, we are healed. That's the gospel, folks. That's the good news right there. Jesus loves you, and you matter to him. And he says, you know what? We've got we to get rid of the separation. We've got to get rid of the sin. I'm going to go to the cross, and I'm going to die for you. And, and I'm going to take away the punishment that you deserve because of your sins. I'm going I'm I'm to take it all on me so you don't have to die and go to hell. And I can give you peace right now. One of my favorite passages from the Bibles is uh, Romans 8.1. Isn't this cool? I love this. I love this. Let's read this together, okay? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do you believe that? Man, we don't, we don't stand before a God who says, you're going to hell. No, we stand before a God who says, you're okay. I love you. And you come on into heaven with me. You are saved from your sins because of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. It's just amazing. We who are in Christ have been set free from sin and death. And maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you haven't gone that far with it, and you're kind of doubting this, and you're disillusioned, or you're like, you know, you just can't figure out, what, how do I make this? Or I, want to, I want you to, to just think about this this morning. How can you be set free today? And that is this. You've got to just accept Jesus. Accept the truth that Jesus died for you and your sins. Let him take charge of your life. Start living for him. Repent is the word we use, but it just means to change the way you're living your life, to, to live according to God's standards instead of the world's standards. Be baptized. Up here, let Jesus, let God wash away all those sins, all that stuff that's keeping you separated from God, they can be taken care of through the, through the watery grave of baptism. They can be washed away. And you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who will help you live for Jesus every single day. It's not going to be easy. You may not know where you're going in life, but man, at least you know who's with you. And that's Jesus Christ. That's the Holy Spirit. So I invite you to do that here today. We're going to stand and sing the song of invitation. And if that's you, I invite you to come forward. If you want to make First Church your home church, you've been contemplating, now's the time. So let's stand together. Let's sing this worship song. And I invite you to come and meet me down here in front. Let's sing.